Hi, I'm Leslie Curry from the Yale School of Public Health. Welcome back to our series on qualitative research methods. This module addresses evaluating the rigor of qualitative research. To remind us uh, of the goal of this series, uh, we're intending to enhance our capacity to conceptualize, design, and conduct qualitative research in the health sciences. There are six modules in this series, and this last module addresses scientific rigor in qualitative research. So uh, it's exciting to see that qualitative research is increasingly adopted in the health sciences literature. We're seeing grants be funded. We're seeing publications in high impact journals. And so it's an exciting time for qualitative research in the world of health sciences. And yet there are some common criticisms that uh, qualitative studies face. Uh, and uh, important to recognize those and to know that there are techniques, processes, principles that help mitigate some of these limitations. The first is that qualitative research lacks reproducibility. So what is it in that black box of qualitative data analysis? Uh, you know, very different than uh, taking a structured data set for a quantitative study and simply rerunning the code and the, the uh, statistical modeling which is reproducible, and it's absolutely true uh, that qualitative methods are not as directly reproducible. A second common criticism is that it lacks generalizability. You know, we talked about small sample sizes in qualitative methods um, determined by the principle of theoretical saturation. So we're studying and studying and studying uh, until we hear no new ideas from the data. Uh, these, however, are often small sample sizes, and because they're purposefully derived, they're not representative random samples. We can't generalize reliably to a larger population. And the last common criticism of qualitative research is that, it la that there's the potential for researcher bias all over the place <laughs> in the data collection instruments that we design, in the process of interviewing and collecting data in the field, in the process of analysis and interpretation. And so these are um, the worries uh, of concerns of people as they uh, address or explore the rigor in qualitative methods. It's important as qualitative researchers for us to uh, recognize and to be explicit about the fact that there are a number of standards, that qualitative research has long roots in a number of traditions, but even in the health sciences, uh, back to the early 1990s, uh, in the BMJ, a paper by Mays and Pope, which I um, consider really a seminal piece in defining quality and qualitative uh, research. And then many papers since then from the NIH, um, from Kirsty Maltrude in The Lancet, uh, from the Giancomini and their group in the JAMA. So plenty of resources. The CORIC uh, tool, which is a checklist uh, for researchers as they report, interview, and focus group studies. So there are many resources that describe the established techniques that do assure rigor and that should uh, be used in order to address the inherent limitations of qualitative methods. When a researcher is reporting a qualitative study, uh, we should be looking for articles to include a whole host of dimensions of the research. And in this series, we've addressed many of these. First, the relevance of the question and the rationale for the approach. Uh, and so this um, gets to the issue of conceptualizing a research study, why qualitative methods. We need to be very clear in the reporting in our articles um, why it was we chose a qualitative approach and within that, why, for instance, we're doing a focus group study as opposed to an ethnographic observational study. And a qualitative article should be very explicit about, um, about the rationale uh, for the, the defined methodologic approach. A manuscript should also be very clear on the sampling strategy. How were the key informants selected? What were the decisions uh, and decisional criteria for selection uh, in the development of a purposeful sample? What was the principle of saturation? How was that achieved? And very um, you know, clear detail provided in the methods section of the, trans of the uh, manuscript. In terms of data collection, we like to see the interview guides. It's very useful for reviewers and for uh, readers of an article to be able to see what the instrument looked like, the inter interview guide itself. And often uh, we have the opportunity to include these as appendices in uh, more and more online journals for peer review of empirical work are offering appendices. We also want to know about the depth of the data. And so for commentary within the ana analysis uh, section uh, that addresses 
uh, a number of features of analysis. The number of coders who were on the team, what their training was, was it a multidisciplinary team? What did the code structure look like? This is another uh, product of the research study that we like to see submitted with manuscripts and included in online appendices for the consumers of the study to have a sense of how the an analysis project, uh, progressed. We want to understand systematic processes, the use of software, uh, were divergent cases included? What, what happened when there was disconfirming evidence? How was that handled? Uh, was there a process for participant confirmation uh, that respondents validate the findings themselves? Was there an audit trail? This is the process of documenting the analytic process that I, uh, that I referred to in a prior module. So we want to be looking for all of these um, aspects of the methodology in published uh, articles. So to remind us where, where we've been, uh, this series was designed to enhance our capacity to conceptualize, design, and conduct qualitative research in the health sciences. We've worked through six modules defining what is qualitative research, spending a bit of time on developing a qualitative research question, when is, the, when is there uh, an optimal opportunity to use qualitative methods, and just by way of another example, for instance, I was part of a team recently who uh, was interested in understanding the experience of young women who have heart attacks and what is the uh, representation of symptoms for those women and what is their internal decision-making process as they decide whether or not to engage 911 in the healthcare system. And so that study reported out in-depth individual interviews with 30 women who had had heart attacks. And we asked them to recount for us those moments um, of the event and their internal decision-making process, um, a topic that really is perfectly suited um, for a qualitative design. We talked about major qualitative study designs in the health sciences. Those are interviews and focus groups. We spent a little bit of time on qualitative data analysis, which is complex and takes uh, practice to learn how to do, but we reviewed some of those principles and practices. And then we've closed with some notations about scientific rigor and qualitative research, um, reminding ourselves and others that there is a long tradition of qualitative research in a number of uh, of disciplines. Recently, uh, we see more and more of this in the health sciences, and we can look back and should look back and turn to the established methodologic literature, uh, which offers a number of principles and techniques in order to ensure scientific rigor of this methodology. So I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this series, and I appreciate you spending time. Uh, and so thank you, and good luck in your work.